of the thing, Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose. Now here's the here's here's the saying of the book under the heaven, not in the heavens. Remember the book of Ecclesiastes is an earthly can I say godly philosopher? Yeah, I don't want to put any true philosophy well. Solomon is a man that got his wisdom and knowledge from God. He's a king. He's got all riches and fame. And he writes 12 chapters on an earthly standpoint. And that's what the philosophers try to copy. And yet there is the God, the Father, Jehovah, found in the book of Ecclesiastes. And he says that there is a season, there is a time. And that's where we're going to get through verses 1 through 9. He says there is a time to be born. That's your birthday. And let me say this right, right okay? Let's get, let's get this straight. You only have one birthday. You're not born every year. It's your birthday. No. The date of birth, that is your birthday. There's a time to be born. That starts off life. A time to die. That ends life. And when God has put into the record, it is your time to go. CPR, hospitals, doctors, medication is not going to stop you. Now like Ahaz, or Ahab, God gave him 15 years. God is able to take away or God is able to add to your years of your life. But I believe with my heart that there is a date recorded already by the free, by the pre knowledge of God, the foreknowledge of God, a man's going to die. And then again, I'm going to say that God has set forth a date, and you can subtract that date. Get involved with tobacco, alcohol, sex, or rebellion against God. Bible says, honor thy father and mother that the days may, li may be lived long in the land. And then uh, Paul writes, takes off the land. If a child does not obey and honor his parents, they're not granted longer life, a shorter life. And then like I said, Ahab or Ahaz, God gave him 15 years. God has appointed time for a birth of a child, and God has appointed time for the death of that child. The wages of sin is death. A time to plant. There are seasons for planting. You don't plant certain crops in certain seasons. They're not going to work. You have to you have to sow the ground according to the season, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Harvesting. You don't go out and start picking your wheat and your barley before it's ready to be picked. You're not going to get anything if you go out and and plant potatoes in the ground. And then you go out too early or onions. If you don't go the proper time, you're not going to get potatoes and onions. And if you plant those crops where 
in the middle of the winter and snow up north, you're not going to get anything. So there's a specific time. And science is always trying to ruin this. A time to be born. Well, you know, one of our children, we we had a set, actually both our children had a set date to be born. One came earlier. The other one was the date that we planned was the date our child was born. And they have greenhouses for the plants and stuff like that. But they're just trying to override what the Bible says. <laughs> Solomon it's just life looking under the looking under the heaven. <laughs> a time to kill. And that would go with Romans 13 with the government. Which I don't know about any other countries, but some do, but America doesn't. Very rarely does she take a criminal who is who has been involved in a murder and give him an execution time. Many of our murderers that are in prison who have been tried two or three times with appeal in a court and has been de be declared guilty, many of them live out their sentence to their, their dying. And yet the Bible says, a man that has shed another's man, another man's blood, by that man's blood shall be chained too. There's a time to kill. There was a time written when, when David sinned with Bathsheba, it said it was a time for kings to go to war. Evidently, there was on the calendar mark, all right, we go to battle, and with battle comes killing. And we've already talked about time to be born, time to die, time to plant, and this is not necessary a human life. I mean, if you, we, we had a, a mouse in our house and we set a trap and the mouse died. Well, it's a time. You don't keep the mouse. You don't feed the mouse. You don't. You got to get rid of him. We've had spiders in, the, in our bathroom, but we don't keep them and feed them. And no, they don't cute little things. We, we kill them. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. That's God. He said, well, the doctor, yet yeah, God will use doctors, God will use penicillin, God will use antibiotics, but it is eventually, it is God that heals. Using man and medicine as a tool. And that healing goes off for man and for beast, pets. And it also goes back to verse 2, it can be for crops. Trees. Sometimes, you know, if a tree is going ill, a tree is dying, you can do something to a tree and, and you can help that tree come back to life. And I, I've had that in, in our, our family uh, property. We had a couple of trees or bushes and they were dying and we did what we needed to do and they came back to life. There's a time to kill and there's a time to heal. There's a time to break down. And a time to build up. When you read the law in Leviticus 13 14, there was a thing that if your house has leprosy, you're to tear that house down. And then after you tear it down, you scrape the ground, you clean it back up, then there's a time to build. A time to break down. There is a time. That there's destruction needed. When you've got an area of your city or town that's as old and crumbling and has no use and has no more value, it's the time to tear it down and build something new. And that happens over and over, at least in America. A lot of old things are being broken down and there's new things popping up. A time to weep. And that's often. That's life. 
I'm just trying to find my note here. Life is a veil of tears. David says that the Lord keeps a bottle of tears. Tears came to the human race. Genesis chapter 3. To the woman first and to the man. I can imagine we're not told much about Cain and Abel being born, but I guarantee Eve was in tears. And we're not told, I guarantee, because Eve knew that, that Cain slew Abel, I guarantee there were tears. I guarantee we're not told about the life of Eve, that when she looked it back and saw her rebellion against God and what she had done, if there was any repentance... I mean, not much told about Eve. If she was truly sorry and realized what the what the evil she had done, I guarantee there were tears. Paul tells us that there are tears, there are repentance of godly tears of sorrow. And then there's this worldly tears that, you know, I got caught. There is more weeping Inside hospital walls, there are more tears in the hospital walls than a church house. There are many tears to be found in a funeral home or a graveyard. Weeping came as an act of disobeying God. Genesis 3. And a time to laugh. We're not always to be sad. We're not always to be, be in depression. Where is a time to laugh? A time that is not to laugh, let me tell you my own person, is to make a joke about marriage. Or Jewish people in general. If there's two things I don't joke about, I don't joke about the race of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or I don't joke about, and I don't laugh about marriage. There are people who make a living to make people laugh. Today we call them comedians. Back in the royalty times, they were called jesters and jokers. People are paid to, I want to laugh. Because life is a veil of tears. Life is miserable. I, I want somebody to make me laugh. A time to mourn. Notice how the contour of the word. Born and death. Plant and pluck up. Kill and heal. Break down and build up, weep and laugh and mourn, and then we got dance. Sometimes what can't be healed they say euthanasia. I'm not for it. I'm more hospice. Sometimes hospice has to be called in because there can be no healing. Or healing is just so much out of the picture. And we've got weeping and laughing. We've got mourning and we'll do dance. Mourning is... It's much more in death than weeping. I can weep over cutting an onion. It's strong... I can weep. Today I weep because I just felt overpowered by the world. I just felt uh, underwater in the world. You can you can weep the happiness. You can weep as one of your children grows up. 
You know, the tear bugs came, bringing my daughter. She's going to apply for her first job, and the, and the tears just came out. It's like, she's growing up. But mourning is serious. A death. A, a, a sickness. A broken marriage. Somebody you love is going to prison. Weep can be a moment, but mourn could be days. And mourning is not usually, should not be lifetime. Yet for some people, that mourning becomes a breakdown of verse 3 that never meant to be a breakdown. Notice how it says break and then down. It's not one word. And yet some people, mourning goes into a nervous breakdown. It goes into depression. That ought not to be so. And yet it happens. And a time to dance. David danced at the Lord bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. What did David do before he brought that Ark into Jerusalem? He mourned. And as soon as I said that, the name went out of my head. Perez. Remember Perez? He touched the he touched the, the Ark of the Covenant as the ox shook it. And God struck him down right there dead. And David mourned and David feared the Lord. And David wasn't dancing. But David didn't take the mourning of Perez to a full pretension. Somebody came to David. I don't know who it was. I said, David, you know what we did with the ark? We did that was the Philistine way of the cart. Here's what the law says. You, the, the, the Levites have got to carry it on their shoulders. And and when David got it right and, and they got they got the Levites to come along and they put the Ark of the Covenant on the shoulders and they brought it in and they're playing music and they're shouting the trumpets and David's dancing with excitement. Now, the biblical dance is never men and female together. You, wherever you find it in the Bible, matter of fact, the times of the Bible, except for David, it's mostly the women are dancing with women. It is never co-ed. You don't hand your wife or you don't hand your husband over to another party for dancing. That's adultery. That's fornication. And I had a man come and ask me one time, and, and he loved the Lord, and he says, he says, Style, he says, you know. I got a question for you. I said, what's that? He, and I did something about dancing. He says, well, what about if it's just me and my wife, we're home alone, and we put the radio on, and, and we dance together? If it's private, and if it's your spouse, and no one else in the opposite sex, you're married, you're licensed to be married, it's done in, in your own home. I would not do it out in the public. Together, I would say yes. But the, the public form of dancing is men with men, and it's not sexual. It's not ever to mean men sexual. It's to be glorification of God, David. And the women were to dance, and Miriam did it after the Red Sea. And glorification of God, but in the book of Judges, there was a there was a yearly festival where the women where the women gathered together and they danced. Then you got Horoi's um, daughter, and she's belly dancing, probably half naked, turning on Herod. That Herod and and the wine drinkers of the assembly are looking at the his his stepdaughter. <laughs> it looks kind of cute. I'll give you anything. That wasn't the tango that girl was doing. That was not doing the foxtrot. 
and probably the closest thing you ever seen is belly dancing or you know a little getting down, getting boogie. A time to cast away stones. And the time I can mention it back in Connecticut. I don't know what it is about Connecticut. Every year, well, my family had a garden. Well, how small or how big it was. And every year we we go we go till up that ground. We get a roller till we till, and there are rocks coming up. During the winter months, whether the frozen snow and the frozen ice or what, Connecticut grew rocks. And you would have to kick rocks out of that garden that you kicked rocks out of the garden before and kicked rocks out of the garden year before that. And you kick garden, you kick the rocks out of the garden two years before that. You take those rocks and you get them out. They don't belong in that garden. Again, when you talk about the leprosy under the law, if the house has got the, the leprosy, you, you you scrape the entire ground, you take away the rock, you take away the wall, everything. And then when they're rebuilding the city and rebuilding the temple, Nehemiah and Ezra, you have to take the stones away and the rocks. And a time to gather stones together. And one of the things in, in, in Solomon's time, in David's time, is they would gather rocks for, a slow, for a, the slingshots. David, when he goes to battle to get to, against Goliath, he went to the brook and he gathered five stones. It was a time to stones for gathering. It's also a time to gather stones for building, making a wall, making a fence, putting a foundation down. A little, you know, you put little rocks down in, in a garden. Or you put pebbles down on a road, on a driveway. A time to embrace. Hug. There is a time for a husband, husband and wife to hug. I'm really awkward at the moment, but there's a time for a parent to hug their child. Even when it does feel awkward. It is not the time today in this society for non-relative to go up and, and um, push, I, I, well, even acquaintance. Someone who, someone who was a school bus driver told me, well, a couple of people, school bus driver. They would do is, is when the kids, when they came on or coming off the bus, especially at the end of the year, when they wanted to give the, the bus driver a hug, the bus drivers had to put their hands back and let the little kids hug them. But they couldn't return them. They had to re and refrain from embrace so it don't look bad. So there could be no evil intentions. And there are moments for a time and embrace I have always been with, with my wives. To, I don't care if we're in a grocery store. I don't care if we're in the checkout. I'm going to hug them. And if they're making lunch or making dinner, I'm going to come up and put my arms around them. That's proper. And a time to refrain from embracing. Church is not the place for couples to be hugging. Not a makeout center. There are just places where you know what? You don't need to hug. There's a time. Not hugging time. But there's a time to hug. There is a time to get. And a time to lose. Do you ever think about you lost something? I lost my keys. The Bible says there's a time.
And there's a time to receive. And there's a time you lose. That's in the Bible. It's so simple. Whatever you can get, there's a, there's a time to get your paycheck. And then there's a time that you lose your job. A time to keep. Now, get is the opposite of lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. There's a time you're, you're, you can keep stuff. But, you know, there's a time when you got so much stuff, you know what, you got to get, you got to cast it away. You got to throw it away. You got to clean out your area, your room, your study area, the closet, the, the, the garage. There's a time that you got to go out there and clean, you know what, and you get rid of things. There's a time to, all right, I'm going to keep this and keep wherever you keep your thing. And there's a time to give employment to the garbage man. And you give him a little extra time for the garbage man when you clean out your area and you bring it out to the, to the side of the street. But the, the Bible says there is a time to cast away. You got to throw some stuff out. And yet, sometimes, usually done for me is when you had spouses that died. And it's time to throw stuff out. And there have been times I, I should have kept something and just, I end up throwing it out. And there are times that I kept something and I should have thrown it out. And we get the two so mixed up. Uh, I don't know if I can say it, but I'm going to say it. If I'm wrong, I mean, there are other bad words. Uh, in my house, I would say, you know what? That's a lot of crap. You got to get rid of that crap. Junk. When I grew up as a little boy, in my house, it, that's junk. You got to get rid of it. My house, it's crap. Get in your room and clean up the crap. Some people may not like that, but that's, I don't think that's a, a swear. So it's a time to cast away, a time to rend. And throughout the Bible, you would they rent their clothes. Ah, oh, just frustration in this the world. And then there's a time I, I'm reading a lot of stories of the Civil War and, and wars and the life of soldiers. And there was a time that they would take some of their clothes and they rip their clothes up so they can bandage their own or or a fellow soldier's wounds. I remember my grandma, and she was a seamstress. That was her job. She was a seamstress. Me, I, if you, I wear T-shirts. And if you've been in my house, you've seen some of my T-shirts, and they look like switch sheet. And they're just gaping holes because they're comfortable, and I love wearing them like that. I mean, I will wear a T-shirt until it just disintegrates. My grandma, and there's a time to rent. If there was a hole in anybody's shirt, except for a female, what I'm about to say, she stick her finger in that hole and she'll rip. And the bad lesson she learned from her grandson was, I ripped his shirt, so he's going to get a new one. Nope, Stolly would wear that shirt until it got worse. Her thing was, if that, that, that hole in that shirt ripped, you got to get a new shirt. Not for me. And there are things that you just have to rip. You would have to, if, you, if you're going to make something and it's in a package, you got to rip the package. I got dog treats over here for my dog. And it's a brand new thing. I had to take, take the package and I rip it open. There's a time to rent. I'll tell you when time is not to rent. And I I have this with my bag. and I, I'm, It is not the time to open Velcro in the middle of a church service. 
unless you really, really, really have. Velcro is El Announcio. I'm opening something. A time to sow. That in Ezekiel 13, 18 is the only time that word so shows up. That was one of the, that was one of the characteristics of the the virtuous woman. There's a time to take your clothing and sew it. Right? It's not a time to cast it away. It's a time to keep it and sew it together and save yourself some money. Socks. Darn your socks. T-shirts, you can. Uh, I did for a while. I sold my T-shirts. Now the next one is a hard one. Time to keep silence. Notice how Solomon puts that first. And a time to speak. He puts the silence first. Sometimes, shut up. Sometimes, speak. I've, I've got a lot of time. I'll be talking to somebody and I'm like, the, the Holy Spirit or just wisdom steps in. No, you don't need to say that. And then wisdom, the Holy Spirit said, you need to say that. Those are the two hardest really in the list right there. The time of silence and the time to speak. And yet James in Proverbs, Solomon tells us that tongue is just... A time to love. There is that time. And then with the world, a time to hate. Oh, you hate mongrels. There's a time to love and there's a time to hate. The Bible says we're to hate sin. We're to hate, we're to hate the evil way. Hating is not a sin when you hate correctly. You know, they, they say, erase the hate. And yet there's one race of people, they don't want us to hate them. But they hate us for what their history was. So they can do what they what we, what we can't do. The world's got hate all confused. Now, I hate the Roman Catholic Church. I don't hate Catholics. I try to win Catholics to Jesus. I try to open the Bible to Catholics so they can know. I, I try to work with Catholics. But the Catholic Church... The hierarchy, I hate. I think they're so involved in sin and so much of the devil. I'm not saying they can't get saved, but it's quite hard. Is it hard for somebody to be able to get saved? Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the gates of heaven. Or kingdom. There is a good hate. And there is a bad hate. John tells us we're not to hate the brethren. A time of war. Did you read that? Look at that. And we're closing this list. A time of war. Now run that back to verse 3. A time to kill. Notice war and kill are not the same. I can kill a rat. That's not a war. I can hospice a loved one. I'm saying that very careful. Because, I mean, there's, there's no other decision. There's no other way. And peacefully go. 
But notice Solomon says in verse 3, kill, and he says in verse 8, war. Do you know who does not have that in the biblical understanding? The Jehovah Witness. They will refrain themselves from any, any military service. Because the Bible says, thou shall not kill. You see that? You see it? Verse 3. There's a time to kill. Thou shall not kill. There's a time to kill. Uh, contradiction. And then verse 8, there's a time of war. So either God and his Bible are wrong. Or the Jehovah Witnesses are wrong. Where's the problem? When God himself told his people Israel, and more so, and, and with all the things, but looking at the life of Joshua, we could, and David, God told David, but in the life of Joshua, what did God order Joshua to do? Go in there and totally and utterly wipe out the inhabitants of the land. Did he not? Is that a, not a war? Is that not the children of war declaring war on the inhabitants of Cana by the orders of God? Solomon says a time of war. And the Jehovah Witnesses say, thou shalt not kill, so we're not going to go into the military. Well, then if God meant thou shalt not kill in the form of the military, what on earth did God tell Joshua and God tell David and God tell other in the book of Judges and throughout the life of Israel? What on earth did God tell them to go in there and fight? One time, well, several, many times, David consulted the Lord, say, Lord, shall I attack the Philistines or shall I not? And, and God would say, go ahead and do it. I'll be with you. And then one time, wait till you go over to the, the mulberry tree. And then another time, he tells the nation of Israel, dig a bunch of potholes and holes in the ground. And yet, and then even one time, the, the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, before he is manifested in the flesh, comes and wipes out an army. And it is written in the law by Moses when the Israelites go into the land. Utterly wipe them out. What, what do you have to do to utterly wipe them out? You have to kill them. But the Bible says thou shalt not kill. So evidently there's a premeditative killing. And then there's a wartime killing. You know how many people in the Bible are killed in masses? They're not killed in masses in the Bible of earthquakes. Okay, maybe the worldwide flood of Noah, there was a mass of people killed. But generally, the masses of the people that were killed in the Old Testament, in the Bible, is during wartime. And some of those acts were when God told his people to go in there and do it. God told Babylon, come in and attack uh, Judah for their sins. And there was a lot of people killed. And God ordered Nebuchadnezzar to do it. When Nebuchadnezzar's servant, I forget what his name is, came to Jeremiah and said, listen, God told us to do this because God says you guys sinned against the holy and righteous God. This is why we did this with many dead bodies in the city smoking. So there is a difference between thou shalt not kill and a military order. Because when you get over chapter uh, 13 of the book of Romans, God says the government has the right of the sword to execute judgment upon the criminals. And one of them executed judgment is capital punishment. And I know the Catholic Church and, and, the, and the, the media has got it all wrong. But when you look at verse 3, a time to kill, and a, verse 8, a time to war, do Jehovah Witnesses have it wrong? When God said, thou shalt not kill, that is not a declaration against war. 
That is someone going out premeditating. I'm going to kill. I'm going to have someone pay to kill you. I, I want you dead. Because I would assume that any Jehovah Witness, if they found a mouse in their house, they had set a trap and the mouse got killed. Thou shalt not kill. All right, you're 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 not going to get your Jehovah Witness heaven. Well, it's not for mice or it's not. Oh. And you never stepped on an ant or driven over an ant and killed an ant. Especially in Florida. Thou shalt not kill. How many ants have you killed walking on them? So they're not the same. And a time of peace. So there is a war time and there is a peace time. <laughs> and I'm going to say, you know, Donald Trump and, and the, the Israel Middle East peace treaties he's signing. Oh, isn't that great? Isn't it so wonderful? They asked Stiley Hayward, what do you think about it? Well, I think of one or two things. It's not going to last because it has not lasted before. It's going to dwindle down and it's going to end in some kind of battle, war, or conflict. Or, number two, it's in the time and the period we are today, it's going to bring us to the Antichrist and the first horseman the, the, on the white horse with the bow with the bow with no arrows. It could bring us into the Antichrist peace of the three and a half years, and then he breaks that peace. Ooh, you're kind of negative, huh? There's no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. Now, there are 28 items that we just read about. You know what's weird about that number? That is the number of revolutions of the moon in one month. That is the period of a time of a woman's cycle. A man who married a thousand wives. And then one day, we got one more verse. And then one day, I was working for the newspaper, and we, we had to fill up the vans every night. And I'm sitting at the gas station, and they got the music over the, the, the loudspeaker. And I hear the Bible being sung to me. And I know it's a see. I know if you quote a modern Bible to me, I can recognize it right away. I can tell a phony from a King James Bible right away. And I heard the King James Bible being quoted to me. And man, that, that got me all night. I, I I heard it. So I went home. And I found out. And by the birds, B Y R D S. They don't know how to spell bird. <coughs> and the birds came and grabbed and ate up the seeds. And Jesus, can you tell us what the meaning of the parable is? The devil came and devoured the word out of the heart. The birds. And the birds lodged in the trees. The birds are a type of evil spirits. Devilish spirits. In the Bible. So the birds. The song called Turn, Turn, Turn. It's a song by Pete Singer in 1962. The recorded album Bitter and Sweet. No, a good and a bad. A bad and a good. And he claims that he took it out of the King James 1611, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And if you listen to that song, it is the words of the King James Bible, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And I don't know how many of you out there, when I said that, it came in, turn, I, I got the tone, you don't want me to sing it. Verse 9, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? He gets a paycheck. 
How long does that paycheck last? What's he get with that paycheck? And what do we read in chapter two? What happens to that paycheck? He dies and he leaves it to, he doesn't even know who he's going to leave it to. There's a time and there's a purpose. And it's all directed by God and the devil. God and the devil. And what we got to learn, what I got to learn is we are not, God is not on our timetable. We are on his. And sometimes, you know, it just seems out of whack, out of focus. But there's a time, a time to, and a time to.